Thank you, Austin. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to begin with a few disclaimers. Uh, disclaimer number one, I've worked here for 22 years. Most of that has been in fundraising. Uh, so most of my references are going to be about fundraising, alumni relations, things of that nature. Uh, so I do apologize for that, but I do think there's some correlations to what, what we do in that arena that will apply to, to every aspect of the university. I also understand that uh, I'm a member of Rotary, so if any of you go to civic groups, Kiwanis, you know there's a hard end to a program, and I've watched speakers either try to talk all the way through in the hopes that there are no questions, or they will let you out early, but run the risk of a lot of questions. So uh, let's just go ahead and get this out in front. Anytime you have a question, just ask me. I'd rather this be more of a conversation than a one-sided lecture as we go through through what we're doing. Um, third disclaimer is, back to the fundraising thing, because that's primarily what I do, that's primarily what I get asked to do. Uh, so as being asked to speak about leadership, teams, uh, goal setting within teams is going to be a little bit different for me. So bear with me. We'll learn this experience as we move forward. So one of the first things I did was I looked up uh, what is a team. And I fully recognize that everyone in this room can read. Uh, so I'm going to try not to read everything on these slides to you, but there are some things that I will read. So a team is a number of persons associated in some joint action. So you get a group of people, and we're together, and we're going to do something. What is that something that we're going to do? Because if we're not going to do anything, then we're just kind of a, an association or a gathering or a gaggle or something of that nature. Uh, but when you put a goal in there, that's when you have the result or achievement toward, to which the effort is, is directed. So in my opinion, you can't have a team without some sort of goal. If you have a team, that team has to have a goal. It has to have a purpose. And so first thing that I would challenge you to do is think about what is the ultimate purpose of your team? And how does that purpose of your team fit in with the overall goal of the university? For example, I know what Mark Keenum's vision is for the university. I know where he wants to grow. I know where he wants to go. You've all seen the strategic plan. I know where our area contributes to that goal. And so I focus on what our team can do to move his goal forward. I don't evaluate, as I always tell the provost, I'm not in the promotion and tenure business. Don't want to be in the promotion and tenure business. Don't want to look at that. Uh, that's, not, that's not what I'm paid to do. So we focus on what our team does. Here's a team that we're all familiar with, right? Uh, so we got Mr. Prescott right here. A lot of people would say he's the key member of that team. And obviously the quarterback is extremely, extremely important member of that team. Uh, I'm biased because I'm an old offensive lineman in a center. Uh, but if that guy right there doesn't get the ball to him, it's, we ain't going anywhere, right? If these dudes right here don't keep these dudes off, we're not going anywhere. So this guy and this guy have either got to get the ball and move in the holes, or they got to protect this guy so he can find who here is open and get the ball to them, and they have to catch it. Simple illustration, but it's just a friendly reminder that everybody on the team has a different role. We all have a different purpose, but we're all tied in to the same objective. And they're short-term goals and they're longer-term goals, right? Short-term goal here, get in the end zone and score. Long-term goal, win the game. So in our world, development alumni, y'all all know we do what? Fund, raise money. Thank you. We, we're, we're evaluated on raising money, but we do a lot, of, do a lot of different jobs, right? We have an alumni association. Uh, we have a research, prospect research development team. We have a communication and marketing team that does Alumnus Magazine, does the website. We have gift administration. Uh, they have to enter gifts. So if a development officer goes out and closes a gift, but the, re the, the gift administration team puts it in the wrong account, we got a problem with the donor. Or if we issue the wrong tax receipt, we have a problem with the donor. If research doesn't give the development officer the right information, we're not going to find the right prospects to be asking for the right gift to support the university. 
if we're not showing them the return on investment through our stewardship unit, the donor's never going to give again. So multiple players, different roles, but the goal all at the end is the same. And you all have that in your areas, right? So as I was thinking through the components of a team, you know, first and foremost is to recognize this, that you have different players that have different roles. We all can't do the same thing. You know, in my office, we all can't answer the phone. We all can't answer the phone because we don't have that many people calling. Uh, some of us aren't real good with the phone, uh, but then somebody's got to do different jobs. So recognize what those different jobs are within your team and assign goals for those individuals accordingly and I'll get more into that later. Second one, and this one's not always the easiest, you have to have trust. Uh, I'll be very honest, I first started working with the foundation in 1997. There wasn't a lot of trust among the staff at that time. There's a great deal of trust there now. Um, how did we get there? Honestly, it's a long process. You can't go out one afternoon and do a ropes course or do an off-site development one afternoon and think you're all going to see them come by y'all and we're a great, happy team. It takes time. It takes relationships. You have to move in that direction. You have to be conscientious in that. You have to give trust in order to gain trust, right? Uh, third piece is communication. Communicate to everybody in your team what everybody else does and what their goal is. You know, how many times have you heard, man, I don't know what Joe does. Joe comes in every day, Joe leaves, I don't know what Joe does. Or I don't know how Joe affects what I do. You've got to break down those barriers and let people know what Joe does and how what Joe does impacts what they do in the overall scheme of things. You also have to let them know um, how what they do can negatively impact Joe. And they may not realize that often. So that communication component is very, very key. Freedom with accountability. I am very big on not micromanaging, and I've got four members of my staff in here, and I hope to goodness they will uh, agree with that. I'm very big on goals. I'm very big on accountability. Um, but, for example, our development officers have a set number of things they're supposed to do in a given year. There are five, really, goals that they have, and I don't ask them every week where they are on their goals. I don't ask them every quarter where they are on their goals, but at the end of the year, they better have completed their goals. So they can get it done on their schedule, their time, but at the end of the day, we're going to sit down and, look and have an accountability for that freedom. Uh, and then ultimately, where are you on your goals? What are the results? Do we measure them? Do we quantify those? I'm also very big on quantifiable goals. Qualitative things are important. Um, they are a lot about relationships. But you need to be able to quantify what it is. And I'll get into uh, some examples of why that's important. And first one is this quote right here. And I'll be very honest. I didn't think you could measure what a development officer does because it's a lot of relationship type stuff. I didn't think you could measure what an alumni association does because it's very relationship oriented. But at the end of the day, you can and should be able to measure things because if you don't, if you can't figure out how to measure it, you can't figure out exactly what it is you're doing and you can't figure out how to improve it. If you can measure it, you can understand it, you can see what you're doing, and then you can figure out how to improve what it is that you're doing. So if you've got a, a, a quantifiable goal system, it's a great incentive to motivate and encourage strong performers on your staff. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Go back to the yep. slide. You said you didn't think or you didn't know that a development officer could be measured. Can you give an example of how you measure their success? Yeah, and, 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 and I'll show you a slide on that, for example. You know, because a lot of it's relationship, right? You know, so I know the grandchildren and the pet's name of this, this individual, right? I know their birthday, I know their anniversary, I know what kind of scotch they like to drink. You know, you can't measure necessarily that type of things. But I do know how many times I visited with that person purposefully in the year. I do know how much money I asked that person for. I do know how much money I closed from that individual. 
You know, um, you have to set those goals, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. You have to find what the important things are. You know, so just to say, hey, we're in the alumni relationship business, and we held an event, and everybody came away happy. We did a great thing for the university. Did we? I mean, I don't know. I know, I know how much money we spent. But did we get people more engaged with the university? Did something new for the university come out of that? That we can quantify. Does that answer your question? Okay. Good question. So, uh, pros. If you've got people who are goal-oriented on your team, they're going to love this because now they can benchmark what they're doing. They can see their own improvement, their own successes, and they don't have to ha necessarily have that one-on-one -on -one evaluation with you to see what they've done. It's all right there in black and white. You know, unfortunately, this year uh, we did not have money to do raises, but in the years past we've had banded raises, right? So merit-based raises range from zero to maybe three or four percent. There's an opportunity you can reward top performers, and it's defensible. It isn't I played favorites because I like this person, or we drink coffee together, or we live in the same neighborhood. It's, no, this person, compared to their peers, outperformed. I can prove it with data. Um, it also encourages people. They know they're going to be evaluated. They're going to turn in all their information. If you've got reports or accountability things that you need them to do, they know that's part of the evaluation now. They're going to get that in. And then again, the biggest thing is for you as a manager. You've got defendable data to show the productivity, not only of that employee, but then you've got it collectively for your department or your unit, or in my case, our division. You know, uh, when Mark Keenum became president of Mississippi State University, I could barely easily sit down with him and go, here's what we were doing five years ago, here's what we're doing today, here's what I think we can do in these years. And we talk about where we are progressing through those. So he knows we're very metric driven. We're very goal oriented driven. That helps to not only managing people, but also setting expectations for your supervisor. If you can show them the benchmark of what you've done and where you're going, that will help you in that regard as well. Cons, and this is getting a little bit to the question earlier, right? So some employees are gonna figure out what the metrics are and they're not gonna do anything but the metrics. Um, you know, then you then you got an HR situation that you just have to deal with, right? Because it, it's more than that. But the last thing down here is don't try to measure everything that an employee does because you just cannot do that. You got to define what the key things are. Um, we had an employee once. I'm big on our development officers in purposeful face-to-face -face visits meeting someone in their office, in their home, talking about a gift for the university. I had a development officer that said, well, you need to count letters, and you need to count phone calls, and I went by that person's office, and they weren't there, but I left them a little note to let them know I was thinking about them, and that was important. No. Um, they are important, right? They help the relationship, but did any of those close the gift, or did any of those move that to closure. So you need to do all those things, those are important, but it's about the visit, it's about the solicitation, it's about the closure. So zero down on what four or five things are, because if you get much more than five, you've overwhelmed somebody. So drill down on the four or five. There's all these other little things that make the four or five better, but identify what the four or five are. Questions on that? So when you're setting goals, um, and this may be, if, if you've not had them in your area, uh, once you define what the four or five things are, go back and find a way to track that. That could be very, very challenging. I understand that. But it's so important. And when we meet with our peers across the SEC, I, I feel like sometimes they're, they're inventing the wheel a little bit. Because if I, I sit down, yes, ma'am. Um, when you set these goals in a team where everybody has a different goal, how uniform should they be? No? They have to be tailored to each person, but then you want to show that they are being fair to all. Right. So if you have um, a certain pool, certain area, right, 
everybody's going to have the four or five type things uh, that they're going to do. Now, if you're in the exact same job, those, the, the numbers within those four or five things may be very, very similar. But in our world, let's say if you are a um, fundraiser for the School of Architecture, you know, School of Architecture founded in 1979. It's very young. Uh, they don't have a graduate who's retired yet. Versus the College of Engineering, which is very old, very well established. Their numbers in terms of dollars and things are going to look very, very different, even in terms of calls. So you have to have historical data within those positions to base it on. And if you don't have that historical data, start getting that historical data because then you're taking your employee's guess for what they could do when you're setting a goal, you know, and you say, well, I'm going to do these 20 things this year. Or well, are those 20 things realistic? They could be really high. They could also be very low and they could be sandbagging you. They know they're going to do 30 of these things and they're just giving themselves some wiggle room. But if you've got the historical data, you can find out what has been produced and then you can figure out how to ramp that up. Again, you have to communicate that. So with our internal staff, it's very easy to sit down with Heather Andrews. Heather's in the room, so I'm going to pick on Heather. It's very easy to sit down with Heather and talk about what the research unit has done over the last five years what their progress is, where they performed, underperformed, whatnot, and then where we want to go forward. For example, with our development officers, and many of you are going to have this, right? You're going to have people on your team that interface primarily with someone across campus. And so for our fundraisers, they interface with the dean of their college. So we sit down with the dean of the college and say, here's the historical performance of the person in your position here's where we think we could perform this year, which is always a bigger number, always a bigger number. You never go back. So that now not only have you set that baseline where the employee, the person they work with closely outside of your unit, and you understand what the goal is, that dean has now been educated on the metrics. Because we have deans that often like to have development officers do all kind of things that aren't related to closing gifts. And so now they understand that your employee has got to focus on these things, that those are principal to what they're doing. Uh, discuss the objectives. You know, whatever they're doing, it's got to fit in the overall. Um, every employee in our division, whether it's in their individual goals or in their unit goals, has a fundraising goal. So you can be the chapter coordinator in the Alumni Association. You can be the receptionist at the front desk of the Hunter Henry Center, you have a fundraising metric in your goal. Now, it's not as weighted as heavily as Jack McCarty, who's over fundraising, but everybody in our division understands that fundraising is part of our overall goal. So if I'm taking the phone call at the Hunter Henry Center and someone wants to make a gift, am I going to say, okay, great, we'll have someone call you, or am I going to find somebody to get on the phone right now? I'm going to have someone on the phone right now to take that gift. You know, if someone calls and says, I'm concerned about my fund, we're going to have somebody, the right person, take that. You know, for, for Lynn and Janet, you know, if the gift didn't enter right, then the donor's going to cancel the gift. That impacted fundraising numbers. They're all thinking about that overall arching goal. Uh, push for highest performance. Uh, no explanation necessary there. And then I got a couple of slides, a couple of other bullets in here. Is 99%, if you do it right 99 times out of 100, is that good? If you do it 99.9% .9 of the time right, is that good? Is that an acceptable standard in your business? I mean, to me, 99% is pretty high. 99.9% .9 is extremely high. I mean, how do you get better than 99.9? .9? Okay. Full disclosure, what we do is not as important as a commercial airline. I get it. However, this picture is from Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. There are over a thousand flights a day, commercial flights that take off and land. So if you're hitting 99.9%, .9%, there's a plane crash every day. Or 365 planes going down just in Atlanta Hartsfield every day. There are over 100,000 
commercial flights a day in the world. That doesn't include private flights. So there'd be a thousand plane crashes a day, or 36, over 36,000 plane crashes a year. So in their world, 99.9 is pretty bad. It's pretty bad, right? So when you're dealing with employees and you're talking about that goal setting and you're saying we've got to do this right X percent of the time and you get pushback, I mean, if they can do it, right? They can't, they can't keep your bag, but... Um, <laughs> MSU flight department's in our area, and we've never lost a bag, so we're pretty proud of that, pretty proud of that bag. So you probably can't see this, but this is, uh, picking on Lynn and Janet uh, right here, gift, gift administration accuracy. So how many gifts did we enter correctly? In FY 06, 07, it was 99.96. That's pretty darn good but it's not as good as they did last year, 99.992. Because we measured what we were doing. We focused on what we were doing because we could measure it, we could understand it, we could control it, we could make it better by doing that. You know, conversely, fundraising totals, 56.9, 103, three years over 100. You know, when you do those little things, you know, communication and IT deadlines, moving those up to 99.2 from 99.4. Uh, when you do those little things repeatedly and you measure it, you can improve your system. You can improve everything that you do, but you have to take the time to, de to figure out what's important, what you want to measure, and then how to improve it and move forward. And we kind of add some, added some things over the years that we're working on in that area. Um, move on to one more. Uh, this is a question the lady in, in the back asked about a fundraiser, right? So not all fundraisers are, are equal. Not all colleges are equal. Uh, but we try to make this uniform with them. Well, we're going to focus on what they ask, how much money, the number of asks, their closures, Number of closures, personal visits, discovery calls, and total funds raised. So it's not just about the dollar, because if it's just about the dollar, that's just one factor. They've got to be seeing people, you know, personal visits. They've got to be seeing individuals. they got to be asking for gifts, right? So, and then they got to ask for a lot of money in order to close these amounts of money. And then they've got to be doing these discovery calls to go out and find new prospects and get new people engaged. So it isn't all about you just raised X amount of money. Well, how'd you get there? You know, it's not about letters. It's not about I dropped off some football tickets. Um, it's these critical things that all lead to that dollar amount right there. So that's a little bit about how we do teams. It's a little bit about how we do our goals, how we do our setting and review. Um, I think our folks can tell you when this comes in, a fundraiser either performed or they didn't perform. I mean, it's black and white. I mean, you're dealing with individuals, right? Price of oil can go off the rails. We need oil and gas to go back up at the MSU Foundation, by the way. Um, you can have a Hurricane Katrina. You can have all these things that are outside of your control. You know, a donor, you know, you may have this league donor that's looking, that's looking at a very big gift. They may not come in. Something may happen. They may die. So there are things that you can't control, but what you can control are visits, asks, and then if you do all those right, your closures are going to come. Now, something that I didn't mention that I think is really important, these last two columns right here. We take this five-year look back, we kick out the high and we kick out the low. The events happen, right? An employee may have been ill and missed a good part of work one year. They're going to have a low performance year. Uh, for us, that may have been a really big gift that we thought we were going to close, didn't come in. Economic downturn, something out of control of the employee can drive a low year. 
And a high year, you know, um, Jim Bagley makes a $25 million gift. That skews that development officer's numbers pretty heavily for the next year. Um, but you also run the risk of the employees sandbagging on you, right? Man, if I outperform this year, you're just going to raise my goal bigger next year. If I outperform this year, you're just going to raise my goal bigger this year. Well, if you do the average, kicking out those anomaly years, then you can really get a baseline of performance. So it's not one year versus another. It's a baseline of performance, and then you figure out how to, how to gradually increase that moving forward. And then there's no guessing. Uh, closing thoughts, put the right players in the right positions. Know who has a certain strengths to do the certain things within your organization because no one is good at everything. Find out what they're best at, find a way to get them in that position and let them excel. Uh, build those relationships and trust. Uh, I mentioned that we don't do, uh, you know, ropes courses and things of that nature, but we, we do social things. We'll do a random uh, Thursday get together in the lobby and we'll have, you know, hors d'oeuvres or something just, at, you know, at 430. Just let everybody wrap up their day and visit and socialize with one another. We do birthday parties uh, every two months and we let a different group there. So it forces relationships. It gets people together who wouldn't ordinarily see people within the organization. Doesn't take a lot of time out of the day, but it's a little something different to just get people together. Always communicate vision and responsibility. I think every, I hope that everybody in our organization understands what our principal goal is and where they fit in within that principal goal. Um, give people freedom to do their job. Let people do their job. If you set the goals and they are part of the goal process and they understand that these aren't arbitrary goals that you just made up, they're based off of some sort of historical data they understand the goals, they understand the metrics, get out of their way and let them do it. But hold them accountable. I mean, if they don't do it, then it's black and white. You either did it or you didn't do it. Um, focus on the goals. Don't get sidetracked by all these other different things that at the end of the day don't matter. That you're, If your supervisor doesn't care about it, you don't need to care about it. If, they, if, you, if you know your supervisor isn't looking to you to do this, don't go try to fix somebody else's problems. Focus on your area and what you're trying to do. And then lastly, just remember how your team fits in with the greater part of the university. So my rotary speech gets you out early. Um, however, I'm happy to answer any questions, take any comments or anything like that that you may have. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious how you measure, you have that about accuracy and, and that chart you have is 99.9%. Do you use software? Do you have people write notes? How do you do that? Can you answer that question? <laughs> um, we have reports that keep track of the number of donations that we receive and process through our gift administration area versus how we're keeping up with what errors come, come back to us or what calls that we may receive from a donor. Um, and we're tracking what we consider a true error, and that's when the donor's notified of that mistake, not something internal that we can fix, we'll put it, but those types of errors. So we have different reports that we use internal. It's not really like a, a, a pro software program, it's just some reports that we deal with. Which also includes turnaround time, right? So how long does that thing sit on, on, on Lynn's desk before it gets entered into the system, right? Because if it sits on her desk for two or three weeks, the recipient of the gift, you know, maybe a department head or a dean or Mark Keenum may not have gotten the report that the gift came in, but worse damage means that it didn't get out of their shop to get to Leanna so that the thank you note can get sent to the donor. Um, so if it just sits there, you've got, you've got a different type of problem. You could obviously reduce your errors by taking as much time as you needed uh, to do something, but you've got to be able to do it in a timely manner. Any other questions that Lynn can answer? <laughs> <laughs> what was the difference between closing amounts and funds So that's, those numbers are based on a college. And I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, 
we focus on both numbers, right? So funds raised and closure amount. Closure amount is how much money that particular development officer asked for and closed. Total funds raised for the college is how much money was raised for that college, and there are different numbers. First blush, you think they're the same number. They're different numbers because we have an annual fund that's going to um, raise gifts. We have a planned giving unit, so there may be an estate gift come in that the development officer was not involved with. Mark Keenum may close the gift. Jack McCarty may close the gift. So someone other than that development officer may close it for that unit. Second part of that is, and this is where we've changed our metrics, and this is where we've gotten better trust in our area. The development officer is going to work with the donor to close the gift where the donor wants it to go. So, Carol, it may, may be one of the engineering fundraisers, but the donor may have an MBA and want to give to the business school. Or the donor may say, you know what, I want to, I'm from South Mississippi and I want to do scholarships from South Mississippi and I don't care what they major in. Or, you know, I hear about this baseball stadium, I'd really like to have some good seats in a new baseball stadium. So when I first started there, the development officer would say, in their mind, I only get raised for money, I only get evaluated on money for my college. So they would tell the development officer, they tell the donor, I'll have somebody call you, or they would spend their time trying to redirect them back to their unit instead of doing what the donor wanted to do, which was close the gift where the donor wanted to. So we want our development officers to walk them through that closure because the next gift, if we do everything else right, it's going to be a bigger gift and it may be in the area that the development also worked in. Others? All right. Thank you all very much.